tener una discusión global al final. Y uh, vamos a continuar con el doctor Sangit Guy, eh, que trabaja en Toronto, Princess Margaret, eh, que, vamos a, que va a hablar de la ablación de ultrasonos y, duras, y, y de láser con resonancia magnética. Una palabra para agradecer a Ander y su equipo para su invitación. Está siempre un placer que estar, estar aquí con Rafael y con ustedes en País Vasco. Muchas, muchas gracias por la invitación. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, Massimo has done a wonderful uh, uh, presentation earlier, and he's really set the stage for me uh, to go ahead and talk about in-bore focal ablation. Uh, so in Toronto, we do a lot of, well, we have two ongoing trials of uh, focal therapy in the magnet, uh, and I'll be speaking on both of them, uh, the endorectal HIFU trial, and the uh, transperineal focal laser ablation. These are my disclosures in relation to the two studies that I'm going to be discussing today. So really, what's the advantage of doing focal therapy in the magnet? And I think it allows you to do a, a targeted approach, whereby you treat the tumor with a margin around it instead of a hemiablation or a zonal ablation. And intuitively, you would think that the smaller the area of ablation, the lesser the chances of having an adverse effect from the treatment itself. But we also know that MR underestimates the true volume of disease. So we need to have adequate margins around what we see on MR. And there is now evidence that the adequate margins may be closer to eight or nine millimeters beyond what we see on MR. So we have to keep that in mind even when we're trying to do a targeted ablation within the magnet. So really, what's the advantage of doing the treatment in the magnet? Um, minimal registration issues. You're seeing the tumor in the magnet, so you can target accurately at that site, of course, including a margin. So it allows you a targeted ablation. And then there's the biggest advantage of MR thermal feedback. So the MR thermography you can obtain during your treatments, firstly, it, it, it confirms that you're actually putting your energy at the correct site. So you, you're getting an image and you know where the energy is being deposited. And secondly, you get instant feedback whether you've attained the temperature that you wanted to. And if you haven't been able to attain a temperature of 65 or 70 degrees centigrade, you can put in another burst of energy with the slight, slightly higher energy, energy so that you get the attained temperature that you want. And at the end of the procedure, we do a post gadolinium scan, uh, look at the non-perfused volume, assess that with the coverage, and if the coverage is complete, then you can take the patient out of the magnet. So there are many advantages uh, of doing these procedures in the magnet. So how does HIFU work? Uh, thermal effect and cavitation, I'm not gonna go into that. It's, it's um, uh, the least invasive of the uh, different devices. But when we talk about HIFU, we have to take into consideration prostate size and of course calcification as well. Uh, large prostates, interior tumors, you'll not be able to focus your beam to the site, you'll not be able to treat the tumor. Uh, similarly, if you have chunky calcification in the beam path, the calcification is going to absorb all the energy and the tumor behind the calcification is going to be left untreated. So in our protocol, we actually do a CT scan, which is the most sensitive test uh, to pick up calcification prior to taking a patient to uh, uh, MR-guided HIFU. So uh, this is the uh, commercial Insight Tech XAblade 2100 system that we have at our site. Uh, it's a company out of Haifa in Israel. Um, they're also running a trial in the US uh, uh, as well as a trial at our site in Toronto. Um, so the endorectal probe here has 990 elements phased array transducer, and that provides a very good control of sonication spot size. And I'll, I'll show you in a video in the very next uh, slide. Uh, it's also mounted on a motion unit so that it can steer transversely, right, left, or craniocaudally so that the entire prostate is covered. And it is surrounded by a balloon in which degassed cold water at 14 degrees centigrade keeps circulating, and that provides thermal protection. 
So once you have placed the probe in the rectum, you inflate the balloon to 60 or 90 cc's of degassed water, and we obtain an axial T2-weighted image. So that's an axial T2-weighted image in the, in the magnet. So you see this image. We would contour the outline of the rectum, contour the prostate, draw the region of interest where the tumor is, because you're seeing the tumor, we obtain diffusion-weighted imaging as well, uh, apart from uh, T2-weighted imaging on the, on the day of the treatment. And then the software automatically generates a treatment plan, uh, which consists of multiple sonications at the site. Uh, so this is a video where you will see that, so this is the probe in the rectum, the balloon gets inflated, uh, then we do the T2-weighted imaging, do the contouring, and you have these sonication spots, and that's where the thermal energy is deposited, and we get instant, real-time thermal feedback. So you drop your cursor, you know if you've attained the temperature that you wanted to at that site or not. Sorry. Did I do something wrong? Oh. Uh, um, yeah, and so... At the end, um, you can compare, um, you can do a non-contrast scan, uh, contrast enhanced scan, compare the coverage before you take the patient out of the magnet. The first proof of principle study using this device was actually done in Rome, uh, Dr. Napoli's team. They treated five patients and took them to surgery to, to confirm if they were able to ablate the area that they wanted to. And then a phase one trial was done at our site in Toronto, whereby we treated eight patients. So when we started this trial much earlier, the first four patients in the trial were only Gleason 6. At that time, we were treating Gleason 6. Uh, and then we uh, amended the protocol to include Gleason 7 in our fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth patient in our phase one safety and efficacy trial. Uh, that is now published in European Radiology. I'm not going to talk in detail about that, but I will discuss our phase two trial, which we are presently doing in Toronto using this device. Um, so we've treated 39 patients so far in this trial. We're including only Gleason 7, grade group 2 or grade group 3 patients. Um, uh, of course, they have to be MR visible, um, but we do not include tumors if they're bigger than 20 millimeters. Remember, we do need to have sufficient margins as well beyond the 20 millimeters of what we see. Uh, PSA has to be less than 20, and all patients go on to have an MRI followed by a biopsy at 5 months and then at 24 months. Um, and they all also fill out the uh, questionnaires, as well as we obtain PSA at regular intervals uh, during the course of the study for two years. So here's an example of one of the patients who was treated in the study. Uh, you can clearly see a relatively big tumor. It's a 15 millimeter tumor in the mid uh, transition zone. Um, um, uh, this was three plus four disease on biopsy. And the urethra is in the beam path, so we did place a suprapubic catheter in the morning of a 10 French suprapubic catheter, and then the patient went on to have an ablation, and you can see that the entire transition zone has been ablated. You can probably perceive the uh, uh, urethra in there, uh, which re-epithelialized over a period of time. Um, we placed a Foley catheter immediately after the ablation so that it doesn't have a stricture, kept that for a few days. Uh, the Foley's catheter was taken out after three or four days, uh, suprapubic a day after that. He did not have any uh, blood or neck structure. He did not have any issues. And this was his appearance at uh, six months uh, of, um, after the treatment. Um, we, he did go on to have a biopsy. There were about seven samples that we were taken from the margins of the site of the treatment, and all of them were negative. So he did very well from this ablation. 69-year-old patient here, he had Gleason 4 plus 3, so grade group 3 disease. Uh, again, uh, this was more towards the apex, posterior to the urethra. You can see the diffusion-weighted imaging uh, pretty dark in there, restricting. Uh, he also went on to have a suprapubic catheter. This is the appearance uh, immediately on the day of the treatment. This is a subtraction image. You can see that the transducer is still in the rectum. Um, and um, uh, we kind of ablated and, uh, to the peripheral zone, but did not need to go into the transition zone. That's his appearance at uh, six, uh, five months after the treatment, and he was also negative in all the cores. So we've treated 39 patients. I have results of 38 patients here today. Um, the prostate, average prostate volume that was included was about 50 cc's. Uh, the region of interest that was drawn was about 7.5 cc's, so this included the margins. Um, and then um, uh, the non-profuse volume was slightly more, it was about 10 cc's. So 
we are not treating about 20% of the gland here when we're talking about a targeted ablation um, using this device. But you do see that this involved about four hours of magnet time, which makes it very expensive. I would say we did have a few outliers. Uh, there were some software issues in a few days. But generally, most of the times, we would um, block the magnet for about three, three and a half hours when the patient is in and out. And these procedures are done under general anesthesia. Uh, deep sedation, I would say, propofol, worsed, and fentanyl. Our oncological outcomes, um, so only um, 31 patients have reached the six or the five month mark when they have a rebiopsy. Uh, as I said, we do a lot of cores only from the targeted site at the five month time. Uh, 26 have got no disease in any of the cores. There are two patients who have small volume Gleason 7 disease, both of them three plus four. Uh, one was 1.7 millimeters, 1.3 millimeters, in one and, and, and both instances, it was just the one core which was positive out of the six or seven cores that we took from the ablation zone, including the margins. Uh, three more patients had small volume Gleason 6. Uh, I'm not sure if it's actually the same disease or because of the retraction, we're catching new disease at the margins. Uh, the PSA has dropped significantly in these patients. Uh, they have been kept on active surveillance as of now. We will uh, follow them closely, and they will go on to have another biopsy at the 24-month mark within the trial. Uh, MRI questioned an area of enhancement in two of these five patients prospectively. I and mean, if you look at the PSA, the mean PSA dropped from about 7.5 to 4.3 at the five month mark, which is about a 45% decrease in PSA as compared to a 20% uh, volume of ablation that we did in the prostate. But if you look at the two patients who had recent seven disease, uh, there's a significant decrease in the PSA in both these patients as well. So, just two patients here, but um, uh, PSA um, not being a very good marker to tell you if there is residual disease or not. IPS scores coming back to near normal at about five months, but then whenever we talk about a group of patients, you have to look individually at each patient. There were four patients with the scores actually um, were still up at the five month mark um, uh, by about five points but we will continue to monitor them over a period of two years. Similarly, for the IIEF, it goes down and comes up back again by the five-month time, uh, uh, but there were five patients where the score went down to below 21, and we continue to follow them to see how, how they will do over a longer period of time. So uh, it is promising, it's safe, feasible, it's non-invasive for sure, but I think we definitely need uh, more mature oncological and longer follow-up data. It is a clinical trial at this time, and that's why it is a clinical trial. Uh, we'll see how the patients do over a period of time, and we'll come back with results, uh, two-year results, and hopefully five-year results as well once we've completed the study. I'll quickly move on to in-bore focal laser ablation. That's the other trial that we're doing presently in Toronto. Um, John Trachtenberg, who's been a mentor to me, a senior urologist, uh, he is a pioneer for focal laser ablation or in-bore ablations. Uh, he started the program. Um, he stopped his practice and now kind of uh, continuing what he had started. Um, we presently use the, um, uh, so this is a laser generator and these are laser fibers. These, uh, this is thermal therapy. Uh, these are 980 or 1060 nanometer diode lasers. Uh, we presently use the CLS um, laser fibers. They have provided us the fibers in kind for our uh, study uh, in Toronto. So uh, the technique for focal laser therapy, we, had, we do them transperineally. So again, the patient would be in the magnet, patient would be in the supine position, we would do a T2 weighted image, we would contour the prostate and uh, the region of interest. Uh, uh, we use a needle guidance device, like a semi-robotic uh, mechatronic device, uh, to help us guide the needles. So once the trocar and the cannula is in, the trocar is going to come out, the laser fiber will go in, uh, you'll have to uncover the laser fiber, the sheet comes back, and then apply energy, and you get the real-time feedback, thermal energy, um, uh, as you're ablating to ensure that you have attained the temperature that you want to do. These are the different MR sequences that we use during the treatment, advancing the needle. Uh, it's very well described in the literature, uh, very similar to what has been used for uh, prostate biopsies as well. Um, um, and um, this is what we, would, we also use. So again, uh, showing the workflow, um, you advance the needle. We usually put in a GAD marker um, 
uh, a marker with small amount of gadolinium to visualize the needles as we insert them. So once we are at the site, I would do a balanced SSFP sequence, which is a Fiesta or a true FISP sequence, depending on the magnet that you have. It gives us a better uh, anatomy, uh, visualization of the anatomy, so where the fibers are in relation to the urethra. And once you're happy with the location, you apply the energy, you get instant thermal feedback, and you know if you've been able to attain that temperature. Now, we almost always use two laser fibers together. So you see there's one laser unit coming on uh, on one side and then the second laser unit coming on on the other side. So a 3D view kind of gives a, a better control of both the fibers together to visualize both of them. And then um, uh, we, we use 3D thermal mapping also to make sure that you know, we have covered the entire uh, area of the tumor, which has been outlined, color-coded here. And then once you've attained that, you know that um, uh, you've been successful. So laser is really the new kid in the block. Uh, there's not many studies done, um, very minimal literature on laser ablation as yet. Um, John Trachtenberg and his team, we, we did the first proof of principle study where about four patients were treated and then went on to have uh, surgery to confirm that you know, they were able to ablate the area that they wanted to. And then it was Scott Egener's group in Chicago and Atec Goto's group who did a phase one and a phase two study. And uh, as you see, uh, in the phase one, all patients were Gleason 6. In phase two, 23 of the 27 patients were Gleason 6. There were only four patients with Gleason 7. So really not much out there as yet. Um, this is our, um, I wouldn't call it a phase one. I would call it a prospective development uh, study uh, in Toronto where um, John had started the study. Uh, we treated 51 patients over a period of six or seven years. But we did have residual disease, even at the six-month mark. And I do now have follow-up uh, of these patients, 51 patients, um, with a median follow-up of four years, whereby uh, 41 patients remain on active surveillance or are disease-free, and 10 patients at the four-year mark have gone on to some form of radical treatment. So about 80% success, but I think there was a learning curve uh, at this time. We're now presently doing a phase two study. Um, um, we have pres funding for 30 patients. We're hoping to get more funding to increase this also to 50 patients, similar to our HIFU uh, trial in the magnet. Uh, and if you see here, we do not take um, lesions more than 15 millimeters on laser because laser, the ablation zone is smaller than what you can attain with the HIFU. An example of a patient in our study, in a phase two study, so this uh, as again a tumor, this was three plus four disease. Uh, he did not have any disease uh, at the time of the five months when we did his biopsy. And again, we did about seven cores uh, just from the treatment area at this time. Um, um, so only five patients so far have reached the six month mark. Uh, none of the patients who were treatment naive have any disease, but again, a very small number at this time. And the PSA dropped significantly from 5.6 to two at the six months. And we're going to be following these patients up for two years. Um, all of them are going to have an MRI again at two years as well. So uh, 50 cc prostate volume, target uh, volume was much smaller, two cc's. We end up treating a double that volume of 4.5 cc's or so uh, in so far the 15 patients that we have treated. Um, so why laser? Um, it's feasible, it's safe, it's non-invasive. I would say it's very precise. So if I have a lesion at the apex of the gland, I would prefer to take it to laser rather than to endorectal HIFU under the MR. Um, I, I, I have more control on uh, how much power is to be delivered at that site. And I think the other benefit of laser is a relatively low cost of the integrated system. The laser generator probably costs about 20 to 30,000 Canadian dollars. Uh, of course, there's a recurring cost of the laser fibers but they're much more, um, less expensive as compared to uh, the inbore HIFU device. Um, um, and as I said, um, very early days, um, there's gonna be many more centers uh, who are gonna be doing uh, these laser ablations in the magnet. I know there are one or two sites in France uh, who are talking about doing this, and hopefully we'll have more data in the near future. Thank you so much. <laughs>